Hi, I'm Mark Madison, and I'd like to welcome you to another in our series of Conservationists in Action. That's where we bring out scientists, writers, educators, speakers uh, to NCTC to give a public lecture and also to do a distance broadcast that afternoon to share their interesting work with you. Today, uh, we have actually something fairly unique for us. We haven't covered uh, this realm of the animal kingdom yet, amazingly, in, in 10 years of doing this program. So we're very fortunate to have two representatives uh, from Reptile and Amphibian Ecology International here. We have Paul Hamilton, who is the executive director and president uh, and a noted photographer of reptiles, amphibians, and other species on occasion. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we have Stephanie Bowman, who is a director of outreach and an educator and an artist and, and very talented in many ways, who's gonna talk uh, hopefully in a little bit about uh, getting youth into nature and, and involved in nature. So Stephanie and Paul, welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you here and I appreciate you taking a little time this afternoon to talk to our folks in the field. Oh, thank you. It's good to be good, here. Good to be here. Glad we get to bring some slimy things yeah. instead of all these <laughs> yeah, well, We need some. We need to <laughs> diversify our, our programming a little. Mm -hmm. I, I think the first obvious place to begin is for people that don't know, mm -hmm. uh, what does your organization do and how did it begin? Well, um, I'm a uh, ecologist. I'm an ecologist by trade, and I started on in uh, evolutionary ecology, mm -hmm. and uh, wanted to take what I've learned and uh, put it to use. So I've gone into conservation ecology, uh, but reptiles and amphibians have always been a, a natural for me ever since I can remember. Um, and I've started this nonprofit organization NGO uh, called Reptile and Amphibian Ecology International, and we. Uh, put science to work for conservation. And we are we're working primarily in Ecuador, although we've worked in Mexico and we've worked in the southwestern United States and um, on outreach in the western United States. Um, this is the farthest east we've been with our program so far. But um, our, we, we aim to make recommendations for governments and for uh, land managers as far as what can be done to save biodiversity based on the best science that we have available. And we work with animals that are threatened by everything from uh, various for forms of habitat destruction, um, uh, largely from cattle in a lot of areas we work with, but also climate change, as we'll talk about as well. And you know, what, what can we do to uh, stem the tide of extinction based on um, our, our best scientific knowledge at the moment? Great. And how long has your organization been around? We've been doing this work for um, seven years now, incorporated as a nonprofit for four. Okay, we've been remiss in not getting you out here earlier, <laughs> although I have to say in your defense, your name came up at least two years ago. And uh -huh. Somebody oh, we should get out here, and you know historians were never in a rush. <laughs> <laughs> and it just took us a while to actually make it happen, so it's great to have you out here. Uh, as I mentioned at the, the opening, you're, you're a photographer, mm -hmm. and um, I think you brought a, a few images of, of some of the species you work with. Would you mind talking about some Yeah, of sure. The first one here is a uh, glass frog, and you can see how it gets its name. Uh, if you flip it over, the, the ventral side, the belly, is completely transparent. You look through and you see the heart beating, and you see the lungs, uh, lungs breathing, and blood pumping through the veins, and all the bones, and some of the muscles. Um, so some really fantastic um, in, um, animals. And part of what we do with photography is we take a look at um, you know, how we can reduce destructive sampling, um, taking specimens, although we still have to do some of that, um, by taking photo vouchers instead. So each one of the photos we take is a record that will go into a museum which will permanently describe the presence of this particular species at this particular place and time. Uh, but also uh, what we do is we use photography as a means of communication to the public and a means for people to see the beauty and value of animals and ecosystems that might otherwise be overlooked. And so we show unique things, unique features of organisms that most people have never even heard of, and the glass frog is, is an example of that. Uh, let me ask you a geek question coming mm -hmm. from Harvard. Uh, your museum vouchers, do they go to particular museums uh, well, for specimens? Well, we used to have a whole collection of like bird <laughs> wings. I that's remember. right. Yeah. Well, that's the beauty of it. Uh, they can go anywhere. And so there are collections. And th this, this, uh, um, 
this is still somewhat in its in its infancy. infancy. Uh, but there are various collections. Berkeley is is a, a major depository right now. The University of Arizona is working on a collection as well. I'm not sure about Harvard. But <laughs> if they if they wanted them, sure, they're digital, so any, mm. everyone gets a copy. And this particular image of the, the glass frog was a striking image. How hard was it to get this? Um, <laughs> it doesn't look like it was easy. It, 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 a, a, a bit of patience um, is required. And uh, some, some, uh, a lot of our photos are uh, taken in situ in the wild and capturing a natural moment. Some like that one are um, actually posed and we spend a lot of time working with the animal, almost training it to get it to, to do what we want. You know, when I look at that picture, um, Something strikes me we talked about just before the show. Mm -hmm. um, the little bumper that we run before our fish and wildlife mm -hmm. uh, programs. I didn't see any reptiles and amphibians there. <laughs> I don't know if either of you noticed mm -hmm. if we had any of those. I think. I, yeah, I wonder where you could get some good pictures <laughs> to use for that. <laughs> but why is it? Why, why um, do we see fewer reptiles and amphibians, mm -hmm. do you think, in, in popular yeah. animal representations as opposed to mammals, fish, birds. Right, well, they're, they're not as icon iconic. Um, and that's that's partly cause and effect. They're, they aren't on icons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they aren't on the logos. Chicken and egg it's thing, the chicken, yeah. chicken and the egg thing. Uh, but I, I think a lot of it is we, uh, we don't see the connection between ourselves and uh, things that don't have fur and yeah. are even feathers. Um, and part of what we do is try to bring that, that connection that, uh, between people and animals that they might not otherwise think of um, as connected to themselves. And part of what we do through photography, I'll show some, some more photos of kind of getting up close and personal with the animal. And this is something that, that Stephanie also works with with, uh, with her art, very similar concept, trying to make a connection between people and the animals and even animals that we think of as very different from ourselves. You bring up something that reminds me of something I read. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, you listed on your bio uh, an epiphany you had as a very young girl. Oh. Uh, <laughs> that, that kind of inspired you to go into nature. Do you want to talk was about what that is? with the cicada? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, one of my earliest memories was with um, an arthropod, um, <laughs> something that had a lot more legs than me and right. no hair. But um, I was in a stroller, uh, so I must have been three or four, it had to be one of my first memories. And uh, it was early summer and my dad took me out to the base of um, the apple tree and just sat me there. And of course, you know, as a dad, I realized now he was probably just trying to get me to, you know, do something so he could go <laughs> read the paper or watch football. But there was a cicada coming out of its uh, shell. I grew up seeing cicada, by the way, <laughs> so if I say it wrong. But, um, it, you know, and I just, I was just sitting there just completely amazed by this creature coming out and changing color and just turning from one thing into something else and I think that you know those experiences just just captivated me right away and I think that's it was something I, I would talk about uh, a little more later but I think um, you know when, when we see large mammals and we see birds especially mammals, there are things that really most people, a lot of kids especially, don't have the opportunity to really interact with or right. see. So there's something other in, in a little distance, but they're amazing. But then we forget there's this whole system of wildlife right in our backyards. Yeah. So I think, you know, getting kids in, I, I just got to see Rachel Carson's magnifying yeah. glass, actually. <laughs> yeah, where would and that I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, it might have been here. And, you know, having a magnifying glass and getting out there and watching ants and seeing what's going yeah. on with the beetle and looking down in the dirt, um, there's wildlife out there. So I think it's it's so important to have ki have people. You know, That's true. Kids Young kids don't that. really make that distinction. My four-year-old mm -hmm. is as thrilled to see a praying mantis oh, as, yeah. a, exactly. as a whale. Oh yeah, so, and you know, my dad taught me, you know, we would uh, uh, we would go find grasshoppers, and it sounds bad, but pull some legs off and put them near the praying mantis and watch, you know, for an hour until it got it. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, I love, I love those things. But that, yeah, that got me started very quickly on uh, wanting to work for conservation, but also um, seeing the need to, to love those things that are a little bit different from us. Yeah. And, and Paul, what about you? What got you interested in reptiles and amphibians? Well, also one of my uh, very earliest memories was, it was probably somewhere out here in Virginia. I lived in Norfolk when I was about four years old. And I remember chasing a, a, a fence lizard around. <laughs> and uh, my dad asking if uh, I liked to do that. I said, well, yeah. Um, he, said, he asked me if I wanted to do that when I grew up. I said, 
sure. And he <laughs> says, you want to be a zoologist then. <laughs> And uh, so 36 years later, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Parents do have an undue influence. <laughs> uh, but the reason we ask is, is it, it comes up again and again. These, these early experiences mm -hmm. oftentimes do drive mm -hmm. um, young people into pursuing a profession. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things yeah. we'll talk about later, and one of the things we're all working on is how do we allow these experiences to, to you know, become fruitful and mm -hmm. allow mm -hmm. people to move on. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of, um, you know, harnessing what we have as a child, the natural curiosity and enthusiasm, but uh, channeling that into adult responsibility and work ethic, but you know, not going from one to the other, but using both to get something done. Very well put. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at some of your other photographs okay. here. The, the next slide is also um, of a glass frog. And um, this is a male calling, and what he's doing is he's protecting a, a clutch of um, tadpoles that have hatched from eggs. And unlike most frogs, where, where they will um, lay their eggs in the water, which will metamorphose into tadpoles and then ta and, uh, into uh, froglets and then um, uh, jump away, Glass frogs will lay their eggs in the trees over streams, and then the, the males will stick around and guard the eggs. Um, and then uh, when the tadpoles are ready, they'll drop down into the stream and swim away. Well, one thing that we're concerned about is where this one was, was found is an area that um, is being hit particularly hard by climate change. And of course, what this whole system depends on is there being some water down there for the tadpoles to drop down into and swim away. But what we're finding more and more is when, when I took this picture, this is what the stream looked like underneath. And as you can mm. see, it's completely dry. Um, and so the timing in this area, uh, it seems like the, um, the timing of uh, climate has been shifting with climate change and the rains when they used to be very dependable, relatively dependable coming in um, in June are now sometimes coming in February or even March, but the frogs are hardwired to be um, uh, to be breeding in January, so um, they're they're missing out. So this is a pot potential implication of climate change that we're very concerned about with our animals. That's fascinating. I mean, we usually we're focused on Arctic species or, mm -hmm. or uh, mountainous species mm -hmm. as regards climate change, mm -hmm. polar bears mm -hmm. or pikas and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I hadn't thought that amphibians are going to be particularly vulnerable, mm -hmm. especially in, in mm -hmm. changes in. in precipitation and so on. Right, what about right. reptiles? Are they particularly vulnerable to climate change? Well, we've tended to think that reptiles have been, are, would be more immune because they aren't as dependent on moisture. But uh, some recent studies have shown that uh, uh, lizards in particular might be uh, quite susceptible to changes in climate and there's, also, there's already some data to indicate that distributions of a number of species have shifted. Um, in, uh, in relatively uh, moderate temperate regions where we don't tend to think there's been a huge um, impact of climate change so far. So uh, there, um, there is mounting evidence, but as with you know, everything else, we're messing with the climate, we're rolling the dice, we don't mm -hmm. know how everything's gonna fall, fall out. We suspect amphibians are gonna be hardest hit, um, but um, uh, reptiles as well, we, we just don't know. And that's one thing um, about um, reptiles and amphibians, but particularly reptiles, we really don't have a clue uh, as far as the uh, population status of most species of reptile. This is not nearly so, so true of amphibians, uh, but if you look at the classification, the IUCN classification okay. of uh, 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 red-listed um, animals, a very, very tiny proportion of reptiles have even been evaluated. Uh, so we don't know if they should be um, um, uh, red-listed as endangered or critically endangered, uh, whereas many of them undoubtedly should be. We, we don't have the data to say one way or another. Why is that? We don't have the data, do you think? Um, the, uh, frankly, the funding hasn't been there because they've been, uh, reptiles um, have been considered uh, lower funding priorities. That's recently changed for amphibians because we're realizing that amphibians are uh, under, under, undergoing a, a global crisis and uh, that's been appreciated now. Um, so amphibians, frogs and, and uh, salamanders and their kin are, are getting much more attention right now, but still if you compare amphibians to uh, carnivores, there's, there's still no comparison, they lag way behind. So chytrid fungus did something good. <laughs> <laughs> for amphibian not really. biologists, not for the amphibians. <laughs> 
kind of like an oil spill. It drew yeah. attention. But, yes, oh. yes. You need to find a way to make them more right. charismatic. And I, I think your mm -hmm. photographs actually are, are going <laughs> in that direction. <laughs> right, right. Should we look at some more? Of yeah, sure. Too? And uh, the next one, I believe, is a, is a reptile mm -hmm. as well. Uh, this is a uh, Kemp's, Rib Kemp's Ridley sea turtle that uh -huh. uh, washed up on the shore of Ecuador, where we do most of our work. And uh, we see uh, uh, tur sea turtles wash up in various states of, uh, of decomposition. This one was an unusually fresh one. But um, when we uh, took a close look at this, we flipped it over and saw that there was this injury on its head. And uh, for a time, my job was uh, looking at forensics of desert tortoises to see how hmm. they died. And so we looked at forensic evidence for, of, of injuries. And I looked at this, and right away I could tell that this was not a, uh, a, a natural um, wound, that this was caused by blunt force trauma. In other words, its head had been bashed in. And wow. uh, doing some research on this, um, found out that this is actually a not uncommon practice that the shrimp fishermen, they will catch turtles in their trawlers. And if the turtles come up alive, if they're dead, they just throw them overboard and they end up washing up on shore. But if they come up um, alive, they will actually kill them and then dump the, the bodies overboard so that the, uh, the turtles don't get caught in their net a second time and tear up their net. So this is a, a, a very you know, big issue yeah. with, uh, with shrimp in many places, particularly in Latin America. And so this is one of our, our lessons as far as you know, what we take away from our findings is, you know, unfortunately we don't eat shrimp anymore. <laughs> <laughs> How did you pick Ecuador as one of the, the countries to focus on? Well, Ecuador is, um, I, I can say fairly confidently, the most biodiverse country on earth. And it's got an amazing diversity of ecosystems and animals. Um, and that's due to a number of things, but the climatic diversity is incredible. We have just north of Ecuador um, at, in Colombia on the coast, we have one of the wettest areas on Earth where they get seven meters or about 21 feet of rain every year. And then in Ecuador, um, about two thirds of the way down the coast, uh, there's a spot that, uh, that gets uh, about 50 um, uh, centimeters of rain. You go down into Peru, there's the Atacama Desert. In right. some places, no rain has ever been recorded at all. <laughs> so we have all of these climatic influences, and then we have the Andes Mountains mm. rising up through the middle, and they get up to 20,000 feet, but then you go down to the other side of the Andes Mountains, and then you have the Amazon Rainforest, in which has incredibly high diversity at individual spots. So um, Ecuador is a, is a natural place, if you're interested in biodiversity, to, to go, but also for conservation issues, the coast of Ecuador and the mountains are been very, very severely impacted by a lot of things, uh, habitat change. And now we're seeing climate change as, as a major factor as well. And we go to um, uh, patches of habitat that are left and try to figure out what, you know, what is still there. And we're actually finding a great number of new species there. Um, and so we're making lots of discoveries, but also v very urgent discoveries because mm -hmm. if we're not out there making, making these discoveries right now, in another few years, they might be extinct before we even have names for them. And I think maybe something else important to mention with, with the discoveries of new species down there, it's not just finding them in and of themselves, but being able to show that there are, that there is this diversity helps that conservation effort right there, you know, in, in the country. Mm -hmm. The people actually see, I mean, I, I was just down there and yeah. we were walking through a forested area and he was saying, oh, you see this big tree and see that tape around it. They were about to cut that down, but last year we were finding this, we were finding that, we were talking to the landowners and they left mm -hmm. it. So that's that's just a, a huge impact. Yeah, so we, we talked to uh, locals who have uh, never been out in their their own forests at night in their entire lives. Mm -hmm. um, and we show them snakes and that, you know, there's you know, nothing to be afraid of from most right. snakes, but these are the ones that are, that are dangerous. And if you just leave them alone, you'll be fine anyway. Uh, but um, when you, you take away the, the fear, then um, people can start to see the value mm -hmm. of uh, biodiversity. Are there other differences in environmental attitudes you've noticed in Ecuador compared to, say, the southwestern U.S. where you're living now? Oh sure, um, it's it it runs the gamut. Um, I, I think most of the in most of the areas we've worked in Ecuador, people are much more in tune to their land because they're they're often living off of it. Whereas in um, you know urban areas in the, in the in the southwest, um, they're 
uh, we, we live in seas of houses, um, <laughs> so the uh, nature is somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and maybe it's just outside of town, but a lot of people just never get outside of town. Um, and so it gets harder to see the, the value and it gets less and less tangible uh, the farther away it is. And I think that's one thing that we work with is trying to make, make things more tangible and bring them closer and to bring something that is, on the other, is in the southern hemisphere in, um, on the south of the equator in Ecuador and uh, bring it to people to identify with. Your background is evolutionary ecology. Are you ever tempted to go out to the Galapagos, um, <laughs> which Ecuador yeah. owns? <laughs> yeah, been, been there, been there. Um, um, on the cheap, there, there, are, there are ways of slumming it actually yeah. there, <laughs> that are not well known. Uh, but uh, there, uh, I'd love to do more work out there. Actually, we want to run some uh, photography workshops out there, which is another thing wow. we do. Um, but um, as far as biology, there's uh, lots of people working there uh, already, and um, it's also very expensive. Yeah. Um, so we're, and then also within, within Ecuador there are more biologists working on the Amazon side than on, on the coast, and we're doing work in the, on the Amazon as well. Um, but um, where we, we tend to, to stick to areas that are understudied. Yeah. And uh, w the coast of Ecuador and certain areas in the Amazon are, are definitely not, ver not very well known at all. I had to ask. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and also the areas that are less studied tend to be cheaper. Yes, yeah. not everyone with cheap tourists. <laughs> we, we can all relate to that. <laughs> yes. Well, should we go on to some of the sure. other? Sure. Let's see what we have next here. Okay, mm. so these are some of the new species that we've discovered. Actually, in this group of frog, uh, sometimes called rain frogs, there we, we've discovered approximately 30 new species. Probably many more, but we don't know. Um, and uh, these uh, number of them are found on cloud forest mountaintops along hmm. the coast. And some of them have distributional ranges of maybe um, maybe three to five um, uh, kilometers, or you know about uh, two to three miles across from one side of their distribution wow. to the other. And they're found on the tops of mountains, cloud forests, which are particularly a hard hit from uh, climate change. So here's another lesson. These are, these are some of the things we're, we're making these discoveries right now. But um, the, their, their habitat is so impacted by a lot of things, climate change being hopefully not, but the straw that could break the camel's back. And uh, we're, we, what we want to highlight is that there are a lot of things yet to be discovered there and that can and we can still do something about but we have to we have to know and the word has to get out there so we're getting the word out there great um, and these these frogs are particularly interesting because like the glass frogs they uh, they don't lay their eggs in the water either they lay their eggs up in the trees uh, which um, the the uh, female there on the right side um, has just done and the, the males and frogs tend to be smaller uh, but these these uh, eggs will hatch out into tiny little frogs and then hop away they don't have tadpoles at all really mm -hmm. but they require those trees to be moist and if the trees <laughs> dry up which might happen with climate change then then they were gonna, they're going to be out of luck. Are they high in the trees? How do little frogs uh, they, they, <laughs> get yeah, down to the yeah, they, they, ground? They, yeah, they tend to be they tend to be high up. I, I imagine the uh, the little frogs can uh, can uh, drift down. Actually, they're that light. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to be very interested in frogs. Is it because they're a good photo subject or because they're a good um, indicator for with, um, environmental health? I, t I tend to I tend to show a lot of photos of them because they are, are charismatic, <laughs> especially that glass frog. Yeah, fascinating. yeah. Um, but um, my my original love is lizards. Actually, okay. uh, there aren't as great a diversity of lizards where we are, and also we haven't made as many discoveries on the lizard front. Although we have uh, two potential candidates of uh, for new species of lizard that we've uh, recently found in the Amazon. Great. Mm -hmm. Should we look at some more of the mm -hmm. picture? Yeah. Let's on here. Oh. Okay, and there's <laughs> speaking of charismatic, an yeah. example of charismatic uh, frogs. And what we do with photography, the the key, I probably shouldn't give this away, but the key <laughs> to doing macro photography is just to get down on the subject's level and look it in the face. Because what you're looking at here is this: this is what you look at when you're a kid, and you're on the ground, and you're in the mud, and you're looking mm -hmm. at an animal. You're looking yeah. at it in the face. If you're an adult, you're looking down on it. It's not nearly as interesting, and you're not getting that connection with it. But um, if you if you you know get down on its level, you see a real personality comes comes out, and you make a real connection with it. And in science, you know, we we learn we aren't supposed to anthropomorphize, but 
I think in our hearts, you know, to, yeah. to feel that pull and that love, you kind of have to let that happen a little bit. Yeah, you have to, yeah. have to let go a little bit. <laughs> I mean, he's cute. How do you stop from scaring him? Because <laughs> um, oh, it seems like little frogs would be skittish. Oh, he's terrified. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes That's why that, those are big. Sometimes that makes him freeze and yeah. you can get the shot. Yeah, sometimes at, at night, uh, because we, you do, we do most of our work at night, and if we're getting an in situ shot um, at night, we just shine our lights in its eyes, and they're usually frozen because um, having artificial light shining in them is something completely out of their evolutionary oh, uh, history, that they're completely outside mm -hmm. of their experience so they it, it just doesn't process so they just freeze there and you used a term a minute ago some people might not be familiar with macro photography what does oh, that yes. mean macro is just on a small scale so okay. um, for a lot of things we do um, uh, frogs and lizards and some snakes although some snakes are definitely not on the macro scale um, we uh, we get up close and personal and that often requires some specialized equipment great mm -hmm. Think. And then here's another example. Um, we also work a little bit on invertebrates, and we have some, you know, really amazing examples of invertebrates. And if we're working in the rainforest, if you go to the rainforest, you have to go out at night mm -hmm. because that's when you see the vast majority of diversity. And we're out there at night, and if we see things like this, we, you know, you have to snap a mm -hmm. picture yeah. if you have all this macro photography equipment. And what we've done just by casually snapping pictures like this, we found a number of new species of, of invertebrate just kind of casually. What is that? Oh, that is a uh, katydid. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. uh, called a cone-headed katydid. Mm. It's an extraordinary image. Mm. I mean, that's well, just that, amazing. That blue what cap. is some of the specialized equipment that's required for macro photography? Well, um, uh, basically, a, the, a, a good setup is a macro lens and one that does what's called a one-to-one -one ratio, which means that the, the, whatever you're seeing um, fills up the frame. So if you were photographing something that was an inch long, approximately an inch long from one side to the other, that would fill up the entire frame in the camera. And then so a lens and then a flash that can actually get really close to the subject to get even, even illumination. And there's uh, ring flashes and twin flashes that do that are the, the names for those, that equipment. And let's go back to your evolutionary background. Mm -hmm. Why why is the evening the busy time in a rainforest? I don't think most people yeah. think that. It, uh, it's it's because things can hide. And so um and that's the, and that's what makes them so easy to to find is because again they're not adapted to uh, to deal with artificial lighting and um even things that are very cryptic and are very hard to find during the day are right out there in the open at night. Or you might see eye shine. Or you might see eye shine as well. Mm -hmm. And you, so th things aren't expecting you, essentially. Do you use like coal miners lamps or yeah, something? when you're walking around? I mean, it must be... Essentially headlamps. Headlamps mm -hmm. and, yeah. and mm -hmm. spot these things. That's mm -hmm. fascinating mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, I lived in a rainforest for three years, but <laughs> I never knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I never went out at night. I didn't have any... Uh, <laughs> Electricity. But yeah, also di diurnal critters that are uh, active during the day, um, they are out at sleeping in the open at night because they don't think they can be found. That's um, great. Mm -hmm. Well, do we have some I think more critters here? Zip through here. Mm -hmm. and there's um, a salamander, mm -hmm. which are, um, they uh, tend to be uh, not very diverse and not very common um, generally yeah, in the tropics. So that's a lungless salamander. It doesn't have any lungs at all. Um, really interesting critter. And again, you can see getting down on its level gives you a really good perspective. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of things that are very big and others that are very small in the rainforest, and that's a, a, a gecko. Um, wow. And the uh, adults, that, that's not quite an adult, that's a sub-adult. They get a little bigger than that, but not much. Um, and again, just showing people some perspective, and there's this whole other world out there, but you really have to look for it. Those are great. And then, um, let's see, I think I've got, yeah, and just this one here, things that get really big. big. Um, <laughs> that is a uh, Bushmaster, um, the uh, longest viper in the world. And I was really excited when I found this because we work in areas 
patches of, of habitat, there's not a whole lot left, so we tend not to see very large animals. Uh, but this was a bushmaster in kind of some marginal forest. I wasn't expecting it at all. And when we were walking along in the forest at night, I'm uh, looking up in the trees because I'm looking mostly for frogs and lizards that are up in the, that are arboreal up in the trees. And I look down and I see this snake here. And um, I have to say that this was the most <laughs> visceral response that I've ever had to an animal. I've, this, uh, the previous year, I had seen uh, both a puma and a jaguar, and I just thought, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. But when I actually saw this a couple meters from my feet, I stumbled backwards and cursed and so forth <laughs> um, but, uh, with, with a little bit of fear, actually, yeah. but also excitement that I didn't think that this would, this would uh, be found there. But uh, the fear, as it turns out, was completely unfounded. This was of the um, hundreds and hundreds of snakes that I've dealt with. This was probably the mellowest snake I've <laughs> ever, ever encountered. It was just very, very mild and amenable to our manipulations and um, slithered, slithered off very, very slowly. <laughs> Have you had any safety issues walking um, around at night with snakes? Or well, we we get we uh, address most of them by wearing boots, um, okay. uh, rubber boots that go up to uh, just shy, shy of your shins, and uh, for snakes that takes care of it. But also, uh, we we don't handle any snakes that we don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely venomous snakes, sometimes we have to take a blood sample or sometimes a specimen. Uh, but, uh, but usually if we see a venomous snake, we can just record the data on it and, and take some photos and leave it alone. Great photos. Where, Thank you. Where have you had your photos displayed? Where do you share them? Um, they are, uh, you can find them on our website right now, which is our photography website, which is biodiversityphotography.org. And they've been actually all, uh, they've, there's been a number in the, in the press this, uh, this last year based on our discoveries. Yeah, the little gecko on the pencil was in a lot of kids' magazines around the world. <laughs> I bet it's it was. Pretty I bet it was. And the glass frog, too, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned uh, sometimes you do nature photography workshops mm -hmm. and so on. How is that a conservation tool? Well, it, um, it gets people out. And also, you know, teaches these techniques about, you know, how people can connect with the, the, the small world and these unsung heroes of the animal world, um, and how um, how anyone can actually make that connection. And we do this with adults, uh, but we also, with uh, Stephanie's help, want to do this with kids as well, because every kid has a, a camera in their sure. cell phone mm -hmm. now, and they can also make these same connections. Great, right. something that's up and coming. And they know how to use YouTube and Facebook. Mm -hmm. and they may be able to be share. more adept. Yeah, I think this <laughs> new I generation is, yeah, and they're going to be really, they're going to be good at sharing things. They want mm -hmm. it out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Stephanie, tell us a little about your background and your work. Well, let's see, I, um, I came to Paul's uh, REI as a veteran of teacher for about 20 years, uh, started out teaching art mm -hmm. uh, and uh, got into teaching biology, so kind of both, and I'm also an artist, and um, so it's, it's been interesting for me in, you know, in, in my time when I tell people what I do, you know, well, I paint and I sculpt, but I also, uh, you know, help people learn about biology, they'll think, oh, that's just... <laughs> That's weird. Those things are so different. And I, to me, that was a shock to hear. I thought, well, what? What? They're just completely fused. You know, you see a cicada coming out of its shell, you want to draw it. It just makes sense. So um, I came in and um, was asked to help with outreach since I was doing education and um, paid attention to the presentations that were being given with the organization and noticed that it was, it was mostly talks to older people and not that, you know, older people aren't active and involved in doing things, but I, I really noticed a big lack in younger people yeah. um, being given information and being encouraged to get out. And at the same time, I was in my own classroom, uh, at that point a biology teacher, and really struggling, dealing with, um, for lack of a better word, fear. Uh, that my students would have, it was mostly high school, but as soon as uh, any mention of climate change would come up or any issues dealing with the environment, the kids would just be fearful. They, I mean, there would be a few that would be, you know, like, ready to join Greenpeace, let's go, but most of them were just very scared, um, would just kind of turn off and become very apathetic uh, and feel like they couldn't do anything. And so, 
I wanted to step in and make a difference there and help kids see that, well, actually, you, you can do some things. And um, that's where I kind of stepped in with the outreach for, for RAEI. And I'm doing work now to, uh, to get kids outside, but also, you know, that you know, it can't always be done easily depending on the school. Um, to me, using art uh, is a great tool. Uh, with science, and I think we've we've so separated things. You know, we've got uh, everything's other mm -hmm. besides us. We've got the scientists out there doing this stuff that's kind of hard to understand in this data, and then you know we've got artists out there selling this work for all this money, and and seeing where it's not really something that other people are doing. But well, you can create art, and you can go out in your backyard, and you can see these things, and you can study them, and you can even collect data you know, with photographs right. and, and make a difference. So really want to empower kids um, and, and use them. You know, <laughs> Paul mentioned using, using photography uh, uh, and using science for ecology, and I think it's time to use, to use art uh, and education to, to make a difference for, for science and for ecology as well. How do you overcome kids who say, well, I can't draw, and so, oh. <laughs> which happens as they get older? Oh, like... yeah, absolutely it does. Actually, we're, we're about to uh, um, do one of our programs uh, at some schools in uh, the Bay Area in mm -hmm. San Francisco. And um, one of the particular projects that I'm going to do with students, uh, and again, you and I both have children about 13, right. and uh, that's when they start to lose that. You know, when they're younger, yeah. they can do anything, right. right? And 13, they start to worry, are they wearing the right shoes? And if they right. draw this walking stick, is it gonna look like a walking <laughs> stick, whatever it is? So um, one of the things I like to do, and this ties in with the, with the macro photography, is, um, Kind of keep it a mystery, you know. Get them in close. Um, uh, working with uh, doing a mural where each of the students has a little section yeah. of it. They don't even know what they're doing, but they're just working on, you know, with a couple colors, the same color scheme, and working on this one piece. That's they could even mess it up a little, and it's still going to look good. Yeah. And put it up on the wall, and wow, you know, there's there's a praying mantis, um, you know, or whatever it is that you know, that you chose to focus on as a subject. So as an art teacher, um, just, just getting people over that fear, it is, it is a big hump, but usually giving them something unfamiliar, letting them forget about the subject matter itself. Oh my gosh, I'm drawing, I'm drawing a salamander, yeah. and just looking at what's there and letting go with it, yeah. It, it, it seems fairly unique what you're doing at RAEI in that mm. I can't think of a lot of organizations that combine the type of science you just described mm. with the youth outreach. Mm. <laughs> what what made you guys it. want to uh, bring those two things together? Well, like I said, for me, it was, it was seeing, you know, again, I have a 13 year old and right. I know how much energy kids have. And I, I saw the kids you know, getting into trouble and, and not having a lot of really great things to do. Um, and seeing like, gosh, you know, we have this whole vast amount of energy tied up in our children. Right. Let's use it. And you know, they're, they're, they're the ones that are going to be taking care of this planet. Right. So we've, we've got to give them some information and got to give them some tools to see that they can actually do something. So it was just, to me, it was just obvious. Um, you know, it had to happen. Um, we can't let, uh, let the generation of people caring about the environment just kind of die out. I think we need to really mm -hmm. teach that, especially since they've grown up in more of a time of fear, at least, yeah. you know, in our country. Um, and they're not getting outside as much. Um, you know, we were talking about how they're not, they're not going fishing, they're not going hunting, maybe they're not even hiking as much right. as we did as kids. And um, having a chance for kids to get out, and if their parents are afraid, well, they can, they can find things in their own backyard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and and uh, for me, um, I think I've, for most of my adult life, I've been in academia of one sort or another, and I got out of that, and one of the reasons was that uh, academia tends to be very insular, very isolated, mm -hmm. and uh, there isn't a lot of outreach other than to undergraduates, right. mm -hmm. um, is about as far as it usually gets, but uh, there's this whole, you know, other world out mm -hmm. there of people who would be interested in what you're doing uh, if they just knew about it. Mm. Um, and I've gotten, uh, I've gotten a lot of people interested who you know, would, you know, wouldn't even think of going and taking a biology class um, or, or even going to college at all. So the, t the uh, presentation that I'm given tonight, giving tonight, it's uh, a version of something that I've given a 
approximately 60 times now to all to sorts of uh, organizations and community groups, professional, non-professional alike. And I think just it's really important whatever you do, um, if you're spending all that time, all the, the years and all the money uh, getting something done, some kind of research, something more should come out, out of it than a journal article that uh, 14 other people in the world are going to read right. and probably just skim at that. Not that that's not important, it's vital, but I think it's very important for it to get beyond that. That's a good point. One of the things you've been talking about has been jargonized as nature deficit disorder, mm -hmm. uh -huh. Richard Lou's book and so on. Mm -hmm. But he said something interesting in the book um, that strikes me about what you're doing. He said the current generation often knows more about the environment in, in an Amazonian rainforest, for example, than they do in their own backyard. Exactly. They, they, and I wonder, because you're doing work mm -hmm. in rainforests and mm -hmm. in South mm -hmm. America and, and the coast and mm -hmm. so on, how do you make a connection back to the kids' backyard? I mean, the, yeah, the, well, Stephanie's doing that. Um, yeah, and that's mm -hmm. it. You, you have them go out into their backyard mm -hmm. and find things and, um, and explore that that area. I think it's it's really that simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's it exactly. Um, the nature deficit disorder. Again, it's that the scientists are other, um, uh, artists are other, and then nature is other. Nature is something that doesn't happen around me. This is this is you know a, a young person thinking right. that nature is not something that happens around their house. Well, it, you know, it doesn't just happen on the Discovery Channel. It, right. it happens, like, uh, under the couch cushion. You know, lift the thing up. There's stuff under there. <laughs> <laughs> We're afraid to in my house with three kids. <laughs> be all sorts of things in that. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's exactly yeah. it. And I think we're seeing more and more, more research is being done all the time about, you know, just the attention uh, deficit and hyperactive disorder and how right. that's linked to just the amount of time that we spend inside being still okay. focused on a computer screen uh, or you know an iPod um, and, and needing to get outside and have those greater experiences. Um, something that really moved me as an, an adult uh, teacher, I had, I had stopped teaching for a few years but got back into it in a, a middle school mm -hmm. uh, in Tucson and uh, uh, it was kind of a small school but I had a student who was starting to head in the wrong direction. He was he was going to be a gangster. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was quite a leader. I mean, he was just a born leader. Anything he did, the other kids wanted to mm -hmm. be doing. But he was he was struggling. He was struggling in school and uh, just, just going down a dark path. And um, so when he was having trouble, I would just take him outside and we'd walk in the desert. And just naturally, he, I can't even take any credit for this, it just happened, he started turning over rocks and looking mm -hmm. at things and this kid just had this knack for catching stuff and bringing it in and someone had donated a compound microscope um, right. to our little school. So I set that up for him. And within a week, this kid's giving like desert ecology lessons, you know, impromptu with this microscope and the stuff he's catching. He's teaching the other kids how to go out. And I mean, it was just incredible. And he changed in this year from this, this kid who, you know, didn't really see a future for himself beyond getting into trouble and going right. to prison like his dad had done um, to someone who realized, wow, I, you know, I'm important. I can, I can find this stuff. I can teach other people these things. And that really motivated me. I think that was a big step. That's a great uh, story. To do something that was amazing. And I mean, he's he's a leader. He's going to be doing some great stuff. <laughs> That's super. What type of artwork do you do? Well, um, I have been working, actually, um, I probably have my slides in the wrong order for this since you asked me that question <laughs> first. But um, I, uh, I mostly do uh, paintings where I'm uh, incorporating um, the human form okay. um, as well as uh, forms from nature and, and showing the similarity. But uh, I've most recently been working on a children's book. I got involved, this is something outside of REEI, but got involved with uh, the longfin eel in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. That's uh, quite, uh, well, it's as threatened as the kiwi, but there again, kiwis are cute and fuzzy, yes. when, you know, and, and well, they actually are kind of furry uh, and feathery. So, you know, they're, they're being saved, but eels are still being fished and polluted. So I got involved with that and uh, created a children's book um, and doing an outreach program down there this spring and uh, getting into schools. And they have Enviro schools down there. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. It's cool. So we'll be working with a lot of people down there and doing, um, using the book, but doing art with 
uh, the kids, um, uh, basically like sock puppet eels for the young kids yeah. so that they can take that home and tell their parents the story of, of the eels. But um, the first slide that I had actually was um, not something eel related, but <laughs> no, um, I should think not. <laughs> when I say art, uh, I also really should say the arts because this is an example of um, a student uh, thinking about um, uh, an encounter with a scorpion and uh, they created a, a story about their own encounter, but then they had to do some creative writing and actually uh, tell a story from the scorpion's perspective. Wow. So the words that are inside that drawing um, are actually the story that the scorpion experienced <laughs> when it ran. When it ran. How so old be is something. this kid? Well, this was me doing a sample. Oh, that was you. So, oh, yeah, was, this is my say. sample, but it would, that would be something I would do with high school students. Um, but, Great idea. But then again, um, you know, young children who are just developing language, you know, that that creature right there could have 12 words in it, yeah. and it would work quite well. That's so very clever. Someone could, uh, you know, draw something much more simple. You know, a snake is pretty easy to draw, yeah. let's face it. Um, so it could be adapted in a lot of ways, sure. but the same thing, getting them to, to look at, um, you know, the experience from the creature's cool. perspective. Yeah. So I'm loving this, but we, we probably should run through your slides. We we're should. Running out of time, I, I only have a couple. Yeah. I just want to tell no, people okay. that are watching this, um, because this ties in both with Paul and what mm. you're doing, Stephanie, so closely to what we're doing. Mm. At the end of the slideshow, there'll be a website where there's, there's all sorts of great stuff you can see. You can even link into... Uh, some of the eel pictures <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in your yeah, children's book, book and, and there, the, so. the myriad other projects that REI is working on too. So, so yeah, and I'm, uh, we're just giving you an a overview here. And yeah. I just want to let, sometimes people, when they watch this, will be like, well, what you know, you're going that? through this too fast. But, <laughs> but let's see the oh, That's the all right. Yeah, I just brought in a couple pictures. The, oh, the book I created, <laughs> I was trying to combine a story, which is what you see within the, um, within the illustration that I did, um, but also the science that goes along with it, and that's that art meets science. So it's basically the story of um, Velvet. Uh, it's Velvet and Elvis, but Velvet is the mother eel and her journey um, down from uh, a lake in New Zealand, down the Buller River, and of course along that uh, journey. She's 100 years old, the, the eels there live to be. Yeah. The female's like a century old, which is why it's kind of confusing. People see a lot of eels and think they're doing fine, but actually there's not a lot of recruitment, so there's a big problem. But showing her journey downstream, uh, and then uh, the smaller text that you see there, actually in the book it, it wraps around the image, but um, it actually is the science and uh, ask kids questions. Uh, well, what do you think's going on here? What's that stuff in the water and why are there cows near it? Um, do you think the baby eels are gonna have trouble swimming up the dam later on? So just again, looking at, at the science of it. So when I go down uh, this spring, which will actually be fall there. Um, yeah. Oops, oh. I guess I didn't oh, have a picture it. in there. Um, but well, anyway. this is a piece of artwork yeah, you were involved with gonna, also, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but um, the last picture is, is actually a young person's hands reaching into okay. the water and helping the eels mm -hmm. in the book. But um, yeah, again, uh, doing the outreach there and helping, um, helping kids see that, that they can make a difference. Great. Um, yeah. Did you design the icons? Or? Um, I, oh, yeah. I actually did do the um, Maybe we can the punch that back up on the screen. For, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and if you go to my website, I'm kind of like the carpenter whose house is falling apart. Um, on my website, I need to do a new logo. So I guess i got to get work, working on my own. <laughs> what future projects do both of you hope to pursue at mm. REI? Well, uh, we've got a lot more conservation ecology to do, um, right. and uh, one of the projects we've got lined up is uh, we're calling it 40 Peaks and 40 Nights, and what mm -hmm. we're, we want to do is go to these cloud forest mountaintops where we're finding all of these new species, and it's one stretch along the coast of Ecuador and where we've got approximately 40 peaks, and we can do a mega transect across them yeah. uh, to cover a lot of ground and make a lot of new discoveries. Um, and and we, we want to do that in approximately 40 nights of work mm -hmm. and uh, uh, video the whole thing and make a, uh, a feature length documentary out of it. Great. So we're, look, we're looking to get together uh, f uh, funding to do that right now. What about you, Stephanie? Any future projects after? Oh gosh, let's see. There's there's so many things I'd like to be involved mm -hmm. in. Um, well, you know, I've I've been feeling a little guilty because I went to New Zealand and found out about the long finial, and uh, 
at the same time, I realize our American eel is, is having its own problems. So I'd like to investigate that a little bit more and maybe even adapt the Velvet and Elvis book uh, that I created for the longfin eel in New Zealand to the American eel here. So hopefully find out a little more about that if anyone Seems like you ought to be doing a book anything. on a reptile or amphibian for yeah, some reason. I, I, I guess that's going to have to happen <laughs> There might too. be some scientific knowledge yeah. readily available. Well, and, actually, uh, <laughs> there's the harlequin frogs are the other thing that I'm, that I'm interested in. So I'd mm -hmm. like to create some some uh, again maybe a children's book um, dealing with the harlequin frogs because the atelopus are having quite a difficult right. time so mm -hmm. it'd be it'd mm -hmm. be good to get that out there and yes. they're they're dynamic little guys i mean yeah. you know they're waving and everything <laughs> <laughs> most of our viewers would be domestic they're in the united mm -hmm. states mm -hmm. are there things we should be doing on the mm -hmm. the millions of acres of land that we manage that could well getting help? our kids outside i think is probably one of the just the most important thing and mm -hmm. doing whatever it is you love. I mean, we were talking about instead of shooting like with a gun, shooting with a camera um, and, and taking walks and getting down on the ground and looking at what's there. Yeah, and I, and I think it's important to realize that um, in uh, the, the, the way things work now, whatever uh, you do right here impacts something that's happening on the other side of the world. So every burger you eat here is impacting a patch of rainforest that uh, that could be thousands of miles away. If you eat shrimp in the United States, that might be affecting uh, turtles thousands of miles away. So we've all got that, and of course we, um, and of course climate change. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we tend to think of what's happening in our own backyards. Um, and if we're, you know, uh, good good stewards of our own backyards, then everything is okay. But we tend to externalize the damage that we do, and we really have to be thinking about what's happening in other countries, and that's that's due to what we're doing here. That's an interesting point. H how do you move from everything we do affects everything else, mm -hmm. uh, and, and make that a positive reaction as opposed mm -hmm. to fatalism. Like, mm -hmm. well, whatever I do, if mm -hmm. I drive to school or go to McDonald's, I'm, I'm, I'm a killing the globe. I mean, how, mm -hmm. it, it, I think it's very yeah. hard sometimes with young people to mm -hmm. Feel, uh, yeah, and uh, I think plus, there's, there's or, the, or older people for that yeah, matter. Yeah. There's a lot of cynicism out there, and if, and of course, uh, people say, "Oh, there's going to be an impact anyway." So you know, what what can right. I do? Whatever I do is going to make an impact. Uh, but uh, I, I think if you look at it from a, a little broader perspective, and you as a whole person, and using very simplistic means, your carbon footprint. So you assume that your carbon footprint is going to be positive. You're producing carbon dioxide right. one way or another, but if you're actually out there doing work to influence others, to help others reduce their carbon imprint, uh, uh, carbon footprints, uh, maybe you grow up and you're going to work on laws that affect carbon. You, you can actually make your carbon footprint negative um, and, uh, and take carbon net out of the environment by the work that you do, even though you're breathing it out. The yeah. bigger effect of you as a mm -hmm. whole person can can be positive. That's a good message to go out on, a very positive mm -hmm. one and, and a proactive one, and, and people can go out and make the world a better place. I want to thank you both for being here, and I want to thank those of you who took the time to tune in this afternoon to watch this. Once again, uh, we're here with Paul Hamilton and uh, Stephanie Bowman, um, who are both with uh, Reptile and Amphibian Ecology International. And I think we'll run that slide up one more time as we go out in case you wanted to go visit their website. But they're doing a lot of fascinating work uh, with reptiles, amphibians, other species, even homo sapiens at times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we really appreciate your time. We're looking forward to your talk tonight. And thank you very much. Thank Pleasure. you. Mm -hmm.